It's the first Sunday of the month, so Sunday we celebrate our birthdays and our, and our anniversaries. So if you have a birthday this month or a spiritual birthday or anniversary, you actually come up and put it in our uh, thing for our, that goes directly to our Baptist children's homes here in the state of Oklahoma. It's a great ministry. So if you're welcome, we'll come and celebrate. Happy Oh, 
Majesty just describes what God is and what God can do, is everything that He is to us. So, Majesty, join us.
pray, and you can pray about where you're at. Uh, we have so much going on in our church, and we need to be thankful. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this place that you've provided for us. Thank you for your presence. Father, I just thank you for all the things you're doing with us and for us. We're so excited to have our impact. We're excited that all the things that have gone on this past year. We can see you working, Father. We pray that you just keep showing us your presence. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much that he's here to guide us and direct us. Father, I know that there's a lot of health problems that go on in our congregation. My people's not being able to be here. I pray that you'll be with them, even where they're at. I thank you for the healing that has gone on and the reviving. Father, I just pray that you'll watch over our schools, keep our kids on a safe staff, staff safe. I just pray that each one will learn what they need to learn. Keep everything in the world out. Keep what they need to hear. And I pray that for our church as well. Close the doors on the outside. Close our minds to the outside. And let us know that we're here for a reason. You make new promise. You make. Just thank you for your love and your just being our father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Uh, <coughs> this next song I just pray is our church's. Uh, spiritual thing that we take when we do because he's everything to us and he's why we're here.
I may invite you to take your Bibles with me this morning, if you would, and open them with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at chapter 5 in the book of Ephesians. I am grateful to be able to be with you once again and share with you from the Word of God. I'm excited for you as you look forward to your new pastor coming. And I know that is a neat time and an exciting time both for him and for you. I thought a lot about what God might have for me to say to you today with the coming of a new pastor. And there is much in the scripture about the relationship between a pastor and a teacher and the church and that role. But then we had looked at that when I was with you before and we were talking about healthy churches. But I felt like, and I felt like God led me to come to the point that I want to speak to you this morning. We're going to look in Ephesians chapter 5, you will find four therefores. Now, if you've read Paul very much, you know that when he uses the word therefore, you better get ready to pay attention because he's got something to say. And after the fourth therefore, we come to the passage that talks about being filled with the Spirit. And I think being filled with the Spirit is sometimes one of the most misunderstood things that there is in Scripture. I also believe that being filled, the concept of being filled with the Spirit is one of our deepest needs in our lives and in our churches. To come to the place that we understand the unction, the power, and the movement of the Spirit of the living God in our hearts and in our lives. And so in a moment we will read together that portion that talks about being filled with the Spirit and looking forward to that. I saw the post on Facebook of your new pastor that was coming. And I knew, I wasn't sure how old he was, but I knew that he was in his 30s. And I looked at that picture and I said, he looks like a baby. <laughs> now I'm not sure that says as much about him as it does about me. Okay, I get that. I remember well the first time I went back to the college campus and I saw all of these young people running around on the college campus and I said they must be having some kind of junior high program here on the campus today. Uh, it was not. It, it was just a change in perspective. Miss Dev, I didn't know you played the piano. But does it make you nervous to play the piano? Well, that explains it then. I may be the only one here that noticed it. But have you seen that light on the piano when she starts playing? <laughs> At first I thought it was in beat to the music. It is not. And then I decided she must just be nervous. God's people have a good sense of humor and enjoy the laughter. I'm going to tell you something. Heaven is going to be filled with laughter, but there's not going to be any laughter in hell. There's nothing funny about that. Would you take a moment and pray with me and we turn our attention to the scriptures? Father, for your goodness, we're grateful to you. For your hand and your work in the life of this church, we thank you and we praise you. Father, we look with great anticipation the future that you have for your body here and the serving that you will bring to them that we look forward to the coming of the person that you have called, the man of God that you have called to lead them. Father, help him understand good leadership and help him understand good fellowship. That, Father, together your kingdom will be in heaven. And the gospel will be shared. Father, turn our hearts to your word today. Open our lives to the correction and the direction and the encouragement that your word is able to give to us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Beginning in the very first verse of Ephesians chapter 5, you find this simple, pointed admonition. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Now I could just stop right there and we could spend the rest of our time this morning right there. That is such a blessed and rich passage. But I'm not going to do that because I want to get to the latter part where he talks about being filled with the Spirit. But I feel like this helps set the tone, set the pace to bring us there. So Paul writes to these Ephesian believers and he challenges them with this command for their lives be imitators of God. The word imitate means to mimic. If you could see the Greek word and take the, the Greek letter and give us the English equivalent for that Greek letter, we get our word mimic from this word imitate. So what Paul really is saying to us, be mimickers of God. Be imitators of God. Let God be the one you follow, the one you look to, the one that molds and shapes your life as you take your life and try to bring it in line with God's life. I'm going to tell you something. We live in a world today that does not understand that. We live in a world today that wants to look at God and we want to take God and shape Him and mold Him and fashion Him in keeping with the kind of God that we want Him to be. And so there may be certain belief systems that you want to believe certain things, so you take the Word of God and you reshape it and you refashion it, or you take some portion of the character of God that maybe is offensive a little bit, and so we refashion God in a way that, oh, this is more palatable to me now. I want to remind you that Paul reminds us very vividly we are to be mimickers of God. He is the standard for our lives and there is none other. You don't get to look anywhere else. You don't get to look at anyone else and say, well, if I can be like them or if I can be like this, then I'll be getting close to where I need to be. No. Be imitators of God. Mimic God in your life. And then he shares a couple of things about this mimicking God that is critical. He said, you mimic God like a beloved child. And what that helps us really know is that we mimic God because it's a relationship. We have a relationship with God that it's natural and normal for us to want to be like Him. He said, like beloved children. Most children go up admiring their parents. They want to be like them. They want to follow them. All of us could share the stories of our children. How at some point in their lives they mimicked us. Most of the time embarrassed us. Because they show us things that we would just as soon not be shown. They mimic us like beloved children. He said, we mimic God because we have a relationship. And then in the second verse, elaborating on this mimicking God, he says, and walk in love. There is no replacement for love in our relationship with God. God is love. You cannot mimic him without developing a caring, sharing, loving heart. You can't do it. I see people that are mean and grumpy and ornery and they call themselves believers and I'm looking and thinking, I don't know how they get that. Because <laughs> that's not of God. God is love. He said, walk in love. Have your conversation in love. Your way of life in love. And he said, we know about this love because God showed it to us. God didn't just tell us I love you. He showed us his love in that his son came and died for us. He gave himself for us. A sacrifice. 
quickly, let me share something with you about love and God's love in your heart and God's love flowing through your heart for those around you. It will always manifest itself in sacrifice. It will always reveal itself in sacrifice. If you're not sacrificing, you're not loving God's kind of love. That's just as simple and pointed as it can be. That God's love always leads us to sacrifice. And so when we go outside the doors of, of the church and we begin to reach out to the broken world, it's going to cost us. It costs God. And it's going to cost us. There will be sacrifice involved in sharing the gospel and being the missionary people that God wants us to be. He said, be imitators of God. That's the first therefore. Now notice the second one. It's a little bit further down. It comes in, in verse 7. He says, therefore, do not become partners with them. Well, what's he talking about? Well, if you go back in verse 3 and you read through verse 6, you find that he's talked about all of these sins that are not appropriate for the people of God. And I'm not going to read through them. You can read through them on your own. But he talks about all of those things that have been going on that should not be a part of the people of God's life. And then he says, therefore, seeing that, do not participate in that. Do not be partners with that. But in contrast, he goes ahead, he says, at one time you were there in the darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He said, do not be partners with all of the wrongdoing in the world. Now there's a vast difference in reaching out to people with the love of God who are in wrongdoing and in joining in that wrongdoing. Those are not the same thing. And God sends us into the world to be his ministers. He does not send us into the world to live like the world. That's what he says. Don't be partners with that. Don't participate in that kind of life and that kind of lifestyle. And so it, it comes as a mandate to God's people to go out to a broken world to minister and love and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to be strong enough in Christ that that world doesn't impact us, we are able to impact it. And that's a challenge. He said, don't be partners with me. You step down to verse 14, you see the third, therefore. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. You cannot live for Christ and sleepwalk your way through life. It demands diligence. It demands attention. He says, awake, O sleeper. He's not just talking about those who are in the church near the end of the sermon. I get that. We go to the early service at the church we attend now and then come here. And I'm sitting there this morning and he's a good preacher and I had a good message and I'm sitting there going, oh boy, I'm out of street. Away! Awake or sleep. But he's talking about more than sitting in church, obviously. We know that he's talking about sleepwalking through the light. There's a lack of days ago. There is something intentional about God's people. He says in verse 15, look carefully, pay attention, be alert, be diligent about the living of your life. Let me ask you a question. How many times you get to live your life? How many times do you get to have opportunities to make an impact for Christ? Not a lot. In 
verse 16, he completes that thought. He says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. In the Greek language, there are two words for time. One word is the word chronos. We get our word chronological from it. It speaks of just the onward movement of time. You know, the clock speaks second, second, second. The onward movement, the chronological movement of time. The other word that is used is a word that describes a given moment, a specific opportunity. The word that is used here when he says, make the best use of the time is the word that is translated opportunity or a given moment. Something presents itself. You see, he wants us to be wise and diligent and alert in our walk with God so that when the opportunities come, we are awake to this. We've all had those times and places where God worked with us, either in us or through us, and we call them God moments sometimes. We'll come away with it. Well, you know, that's just a God moment. That's kind of what Paul was talking about here. He said you're going to have some God moments in your life when God's going to give you opportunities, God's going to give you a chance to do something, God is going to show you something or teach you something or help you teach someone else. And who knows the, the breadth of those opportunities? But what he is saying when he comes to this third, therefore, awake, live your life with your eyes open so that you can make the best use of the opportunities that God gives to you in your life. Because let me remind you something. You don't get them twice. When they're gone, they're gone. Some of you know me well enough to know that I'm a hunter. I hunt a lot. And love it. And when you're hunting, there will be a given moment that you have an opportunity to take that big buck. And it can be quick and it can be clean. And if you're not ready, he's gone. And let me tell you something about the big bucks. And some of you hunt, you know how I'm talking about. You don't see them very well. They're wise. You don't see them very often. If you don't take advantage of the opportunity, you're likely not to get it again. This is the, what Paul is reminding us. Make the most of the opportunity because the days are evil. They're not going to keep rolling around. And then he comes to the fourth, therefore. Therefore, and let me invite your attention to the scripture. We're going to read through several verses now. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul comes to this fourth therefore. He is ending this section. He's going to begin a new section in verse 22 that has to do with earthly relationships. And here he's ending this section where he's talking about challenging us to be mimickers, imitators of God. In verse 17, and he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So let me turn that around for you. If we don't understand and follow the will of the Lord, we are living foolish. How 
stupid is it for someone not to follow the will of the Lord? Yeah. Uh, I, I know someone one time I said, my mom used to wash my mouth out for using the word stupid with soap, among other things. <laughs> Because that wasn't the word that we were supposed to use at our house. But I'm going to tell you something. It fits here. It is appropriate here. How, how stupid would it be? How unwise, how foolish to not understand and follow the will of God. The will of God simply speaks of God's desire for our lives. You see, if you're a believer... And you know Jesus Christ lives in your heart. There is a yearning put in there by him to follow God's will for your life and to fulfill God's plan and not your own. You have been bought with a price. You no longer belong to yourself. You belong to God. You're his lock, stock, and barrel. Therefore, understand, follow, and do his will. He said, understand what the will of the Lord is. In verse 18, he continues in, he says, and do not get drunk with wine. He said, in that is excess or debauchery. The word literally means unsaving. Don't get drunk with wine. That is unsaving. I've seen a few lives unsaved because of the influence of alcohol. And so have you. Don't get drunk with the wine. Don't be controlled by something from the outside that you put into your body. It leads to excessive abuse. But in contrast to that, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Here's a comparison. person drunk with wine compared to the person filled with the Spirit. The one is commanded not to be filled with wine, which leads to this excessive, sinful, wasteful kind of life. <coughs> or be filled with the Spirit of God. See, God's people are to be filled by God's Spirit. The word filled here means to flood, to control, to fill up, to supply liberally, to literally flow throughout everywhere. The idea is that we are so filled with the Spirit of God that the Spirit of God controls our lives. Just like the person who is so filled with wine comes to the point that the alcohol is determining their behavior and their actions. We come to the place in Christ that the spirit of the living God indwells us and infills us and controls our behavior, our words, our attitudes, our actions. Be filled with the spirit. Be controlled by the spirit of God. It is this filling of the spirit that enables and helps us to empty ourselves to ourself and be filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God requires a willing subject, a surrendered vessel, that we come to God and say, I am here, available. Fill me. Use me. Help me be what you need me to be. Be filled with the Spirit. Now if I've got any word for you to challenge you in preparation for the coming of the man of God that will be in this pulpit next week. You walk in here having done business with God and turn your heart to Him and say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with your spirit. You cannot do the work of God without the filling of His spirit. We're too weak. We need, we require 
the Spirit of the living God to fill us. Read the book of Acts. What did they plead for? Lord, fill us with your Spirit that we may continue to speak your word with boldness. The power of God for the work of God in the people of God. That's what it means to be Spirit-filled. Now he spends the rest of this section that we're going to look at talking about the life of the spirit field. But I want to tell you one thing is not the mark of the spirit filled person that is often misunderstood in today's world. And there are people who will look at you and say, if you have not spoken in tongues, you have not been filled with the spirit of God. And not to be unpolite to people who might believe such things, I'm going to tell you that doesn't come from the pages of the New Testament. Is speaking in tongues a spiritual gift? Absolutely. Practice at Corinth greatly. But let me remind you, Corinth was not a spiritual church. It was a carnal, fleshly, troubled church. And yet they spoke in tongues more than any other New Testament church that we know about. So don't mark tongues off as the mark of fullness of the Spirit. And I'm not disqualifying tongues as a spiritual gift. Don't misunderstand me. But don't make one spiritual gift the criteria for whether or not you have been filled with the Spirit of God. There are many other spiritual gifts. In fact, a greater test of whether you've been filled with the Spirit of God than uh, the spiritual gifts and their practice is the fruit of the Spirit that Galatians talks about. Try having that spirit and that attitude everywhere you go. And you'll understand your need for the Spirit of God. So let's look. He gives us three things that mark off the life of the person who is filled with the Spirit. He said, be filled with the Spirit of God in verse 19. And he said, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Being filled with the Spirit gives the believer a heart to worship. It gives you a heart for addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. You notice the different kinds of music that is mentioned here that flows from the heart of these people. They sing the psalms. They sing hymns. They sing spiritual songs. There was room for all of it. As I think back over the years that I was a pastor, I think probably one of the things that aggravated me the most was watching the foolishness of people getting all upset over one genre of music. Oh, we love the hymns. Well, I love Mark and Beethoven. Well, I love the new music. Let me remind you of something. It's God's music. All oh, if it honors Jesus. And just because you have a favorite job right here, doesn't mean that it's better or worse than something. They sing it all. Let me tell you something. You are not filled with the Spirit of God if you're fussing about the music your church is singing. Amen. You hear what Paul says? It goes deeper. goes to the heart and it flows naturally out because the spirit of the glorious God is in us singing praises through his spirit to himself through his vessel praising God giving glory to God why is that such a big thing because my tendency and your tendency is I want to worship me instead of God and the Spirit of God releases me from that. Enables me to worship God instead of me. And 
it allows me to center my life on Him and adore Him and worship Him and honor Him and lift Him up and glorify Him instead of looking around and saying, well, why isn't everybody looking at me? Why isn't everybody glorifying me? Why isn't everybody worshiping me? <coughs> the Spirit of God frees us for the movement and the hand and the work of God. And it reveals itself in our worship of the living God. As we join together in that worship. Notice the second thing he says there in verse 20. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing that happens when we begin to be filled with the Spirit is we are filled with the Spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. We cannot give thanks enough. It, it, it opens our eyes to see the fullness of what God has done for us, and it opens our hearts to return to Him that worship of thanksgiving that says, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in Christ. And more and more, it just fills our life with this spirit of thanksgiving. You see, a life that is filled with gratitude and thanksgiving helps empty us of our selfishness, self-desire. When I am focused on what God has done and the greatness of God, it helps me minimize my own self centeredness That's the reason over in Romans chapter 1, when he's talking about all of those sins that are so horrible, that reveal us as a condemned, sinful people who need saved, in the midst of that you will find this work, and they were ungrateful. Ungrateful. You see, ungrateful people are selfish people. You see, ungrateful people are people who deserve what they get. Let me ask you, how long has it been since you've seen on television and some commercial pop song, get what you deserve? started learning that getting our way was the most important thing. And by the time we're two years old, we've got that lesson down path. We know how to get our way. And we know how to insist. Unless we are discouraged. And wise parents know how to discourage that. We're used to getting our own way. We want our own way. We believe our way is best. We believe our way is the goodest. Not good English, but it translates well to the meaning. You hear what the fullness of the Spirit brings to the body? Submission to one another. Submission. Submitting to one another. Mutual submission is a mark of the spirit. 
This may be the time that God's Spirit is leading you. You may just want to come to the Lord this altar and say, Lord, here I am. Do whatever you need to do with me to help me be full of your Spirit. Whatever work you need to do in my heart, Lord, cleanse me. Heal me. Make me holy. Fill me with your power. Perhaps you're here and God has spoken to you from His Word in a different way. It is just like you to come and hear what God has to say to you that this is God's time. If you need someone to pray with, I would be here and be delighted to do that. But a lot of times, you just need to talk to God. Would you take this time and do this? Father, let our hearts be attuned to you in this moment and this time. Fill us with your power and with your mind. Let your Holy Spirit reign in us. To fill us and lead us. Speak to us this morning through your Spirit. 